And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Hello and welcome to the Teach Thought Podcast. My name is Drew Perkins. I'm the Director of Teach Thought Professional Development. And with 2019 kicking us off here, it's a good time to maybe do a little housekeeping and maintenance. So you'll probably notice some new artwork, which includes language that helps describe the mission of this podcast, which is to provide conversations to help educators like you think and better prepare learners for the modern world. Of course, all of this is under the umbrella of TeachThought.com, and the mission of TeachThought is to innovate education through the growth of innovative teachers. And as part of that, we have, of course, TeachThought Professional Development. And because we use the lens of inquiry to design and deliver our professional development, we like to use a mission question instead of a mission statement. And that is, how can we help educators better prepare learners for the modern world? If you've just stumbled upon us and are not familiar with our websites, please go to teachthought.com or wegrowteachers.com for more information. And here at Teach Thought Professional Development, we are looking forward to helping educators around the world grow your craft through workshops and upcoming events. And of course, you can keep up to date with those events by subscribing to our email newsletter, checking in on the site and our social media of course and listening in here and please don't forget to leave those helpful reviews and share with your networks In this episode, I spoke with Natalie Wexler, who is an author and education journalist. She's a regular contributor to Forbes and has a couple books, one which is coming out in August called The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. And we talked mostly about an article that I noticed recently, which is entitled To Attack Inequality, We Need a Different Kind of Education. I thought it would be a good conversation, and it was because of her characterization and thinking about constructivist teaching and learning. So we started our conversation talking about that and the importance of education not serving low SES kids in the elementary grades especially. So we touched on the topics of constructivism and literacy and knowledge and content as well as inquiry and ended our conversation talking about homework as that was also a recent Forbes article. So interesting conversation. Again, I knew that I had some overlap with her and some disagreements and as I think is important, it's always rewarding to talk with somebody in meaningful ways, even ones that you disagree with, perhaps more importantly so. I hope you enjoy the podcast and find it meaningful. Well, hi, Natalie. Welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to have you on. I'm going to give you an opportunity, as I often do, to tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and give some context for our conversation. So please do. Sure. Um, Well, I'm delighted to be here and thanks for inviting me, Drew. Um, So I am an education writer and um, I'm a contributor at Forbes.com on education. Um, Also the co-author of a book that came out in 2017 called The Writing Revolution, A Guide to Advancing Thinking Through Writing in All Subjects and Grades. And my co-author on that book is Judith C. Hockman. And then I'm also the author of a book that's going to be coming out in August 2019 called The Knowledge Gap. The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. Okay, and you have some background in uh, as a historian as well. And, and so how did, how did you get to being an education journalist and author, or, or were you just born that way? <laughs> <laughs> no, was not born that way. That would have been a lot easier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, it was a pretty circuitous route. I mean, I've done a number of things, but um, I did start out as as a journalist and a reporter briefly and then went to law school and then became a legal historian. Um, I have a master's in history, but um, basically about 
10 years ago now, um, I decided to return to my roots, I guess, in journalism. And I started writing about education in Washington, D.C., where I live, where there's, you know, it's there's been a lot of education reform activity here. And I realized that um, I had become aware of it. I'd gotten very interested in it um, basically as an observer. And I realized that there wasn't enough coverage of all that was going on. Um, the, the Washington Post, you know, couldn't possibly cover everything that was going on. So I started uh, blogging about it for um, a sort of communal news website called uh, Greater Greater Washington. And in the course of doing that, I, I uh, stumbled across a few things that struck me as really fundament, fundamental pervasive problems in education that were way bigger than a blog post or even a series of blog posts. And um, so I, one of them was um, our uh, failure to teach kids explicitly how to write, um, how to do expository writing. And um, another was um, that I realized there were huge knowledge gaps um, on the part of kids that really became apparent in high school and um, discovered through a, almost accidentally discovered that the roots of that problem really lie in elementary school where we're really not building kids knowledge in the way we need to, especially for kids who are not absorbing a lot of n academic knowledge and vocabulary at home. Yeah, and there's lots to dig into here. I came across your Forbes article in it was December 27th, and the title of that is to, to Attack Inequality, We Need a Different Kind of Education. And you have some other pieces. Uh, more recently, you have, have one around homework and, of course, your upcoming book talking about knowledge gap. And so lots of lots of ground to cover here. Perhaps we'll we'll cover all or most of it in our time together. But starting with that attacking inequality piece, certainly I agree with that. Uh, well, I guess let me let me start with the question that lots of folks seem to sort of debate in some way, which is the the assertion that our education system is broken. Would you characterize it that way or is it just dysfunctional or how would you characterize it? Um, I, I certainly would say that it's broken in regard to the most vulnerable students uh, in our country, the ones who rely the most on school for um familiarizing them with the wider world and uh, increasing their chances of success in life. Um, I, you know, I think our, it's very hard to generalize about our education system because it is far from monolithic, as I'm sure you're aware. Sure. We have you know, 14,000 school districts and even within those districts, there's tremendous variation within schools. So I would say my primary focus is on the ways that it is not serving the interests of um the most disadvantaged students. I do think it could also be better for all students, though. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would agree with that. And and I don't even, I, I asked that question with the full recognition that I'm not sure if that's how worthy that question is of being asked. I mean, if it's broken or dysfunctional, what whatever we call it or label it is perhaps not all that uh, valuable. <laughs> but yeah. the fact that we certainly should aim for improving it. And I would agree in many ways, the the low socioeconomic status students are underserved in so many ways. And it, I guess let me let me give you the opportunity to characterize that. I know that that you and I perhaps have some differences in how you you view or how we view constructive, constructivist education. I don't think that's necessarily the the only reason for why you think low socioeconomic kids are are not being served as well. So what's what is what is not happening with those underprivileged kids that needs to be happening, whether it's constructivist yeah. or not? Yeah. Um, well I think the most um, glaring problem is and, and the one that has been overlooked the most is what is going on in elementary schools in this country. And um, I think elementary education, I think education reformers has seen, have seen that as sort of the bright spot in education because the test scores 
tend to be a little higher and they tend to be a little easier to raise at the elementary level. Um, and then the assumption is that we're th the real problem is at high school. But um, what we're, the elementary curriculum for a long time has basically just been reading and math. Um, and the assumption has been, and that's been um, exacerbated since no Child Left Behind came in and we've had this era of high stakes testing and reading and math. And those subjects have been elevated above things like social studies and science and the arts. And those subjects, those, those content subjects have been pretty much crowded out of the curriculum, especially in schools where test scores are low. And reading has been it, it interpreted to mean both decoding, the decoding aspects of reading. So figuring out, you know, what letters make what sounds and those correspondences, but also reading comprehension. And, and this is a real problem here. So the assumption has been that we can teach reading comprehension as though it were a set of skills like decoding. And those reading standardized reading tests appear to te be testing these sort of general comprehension skills like, can you find the main idea of this passage? Can you make inferences about this, this text? The problem is, as cognitive psychologists have known for decades, the most important factor in reading comprehension is whether how much background knowledge and vocabulary you have about the topic. And the, so the way to boost reading comprehension really is not to work on these illusory reading skills. They will not help you if you don't have enough background knowledge to understand the text. The way to boost reading comprehension is to teach all those things we've eliminated from the curriculum, like social studies, like science, like the arts, and to expand kids' knowledge of the world and their vocabulary. Um, and what happens is and that, you know, when kids get to high school and they're suddenly expected to do high school level work, they may never have been exposed to any history, to any science. And it's almost impossible for them to do that grade level work without that background knowledge. Now, you may say that that approach doesn't have much to do with constructivist education, that this focus on reading comprehension skills um, is, is not part of the constructivist approach. And I would say to, up to a point, you're right about that, but um, it's got a, it's a complicated history. And I think that where constructivism and this approach to reading comprehension skills intersect is that there is this general feeling um, among educators who have been through schools of education that, that train them in a constructivist approach. There's this feeling that you really shouldn't stand up and teach content, that it's much better to just to let kids discover that or, or construct their knowledge for themselves. And so it's it's better to just give kids the skills, the tools they need to acquire knowledge on their own. Um, and that fits in very nicely with this approach to reading comprehension skills. You know, well, I'm not actually teaching you anything substantive, but I'm giving you the tools you need to discover that knowledge yourself. Well, that's interesting. I, I would agree with you for sure that the idea that we sort of jettison social studies and some of the other content areas in place uh, or in pursuit of higher skills, you know, math and reading skills, which absolutely are essential, especially those foundational ones, I, that, that's really highly problematic insofar as that it it strips, often strips so much of the reading and or math from any context and and to me that context is just absolutely vital it's sort of like you know those things you mentioned that background knowledge and those pieces and in your your Forbes article you 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 acknowledge you know talking about the the most extreme form of constructivist education and I guess I would I I don't perhaps subscribe to a constructivist education approach where as I, I joke about it and have joked about it lots as uh, the idea of free range chicken you know just that free school kind of approach I, I do acknowledge that there are some students for which that might work there there clearly are some students who will lead their own learning i just did a podcast i haven't published it yet but with a and we did a blog piece of a young lady in new zealand she's what would be our 11th grade 
who uh, did a TEDx talk talking about project-based learning. And as I talked with her, she just really came on project-based learning as a as a as a powerful way of learning more so because one of our teachers sort of did a passion project and it was pbl ish most of the students struggled and that's the that's the worst case scenario we even talked about that in that podcast talking about doing project based learning or constructivist learning poorly is just a, 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 what i would call a train wreck so right. what we want to do in in my view in thinking about constructivist education is to yes give them the tools but also it's a it's a really skilled facilitation process that helps them as learners ask the questions and identify what it is that we need to be able to do and understand and learn in order to accomplish sort of whatever task and challenge that we're after and that that is not i mean again coming back to those passion projects those can be such a again train wreck where you have hey do what you you know find find something you you're really interested in and pursue it and i'll see you in two or three weeks and let's see what happens and as the young lady Ewan wong is her name she she says you know there's lots of students for which it just was terrible they 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 got nothing done and and that that is not what we're after unfortunately there are some teachers who do that just like there are some teachers who lecture all day and you know test and drill and kill so for me i think the the labeling of constructivist education needs to be in progressive education needs to be really thoughtful and and we did a blog piece i did a blog piece uh, talking about the role of knowledge in, in constructivist progressive education and it really knowledge and content should be a really main integral piece of that Yes, I, I mean, I think I totally agree with you that a big problem with project-based, inquiry-based approaches is that it's very hard to do them well. And I think, you know, and I also agree that we, we don't want to go to either extreme. We don't want a teacher lecturing to first graders for an hour, um, nor do we want them to be told, okay, just go pursue whatever interests you. There, There's some happy medium. Um, and I, I think that one of the key... Uh, questions though in addition to so so there's there are two problems that i see with a uh, project based approach let's let's avoid constructivist for the moment and sure. since you mentioned project based um, and i i know from personal experience i can remember as a child doing a year long sort of i suppose you would call it project based education uh, I think I was in sixth grade and, and that year has stuck with me, you know, to this very day. So I know it has power, but I think there are these two problems. One is it's hard to do it well. And that, you, you know, then you have to ask, well, if it is so hard to do it well, is it a realistic scalable approach? And the other is um, that it's going to work best when the students engaged in project-based learning already have a certain threshold level of knowledge about the topic that the project is focusing on. Um, they, it's, it's, you know, not, I don't think a project is a good way to, to just acquire basic information about any topic. And I think it's, you didn't mention this necessarily, but to allow kids to just choose whatever they happen to be interested in to work on is really depriving them of the opportunity to learn about new things that they don't even know they could get really interested in that the teacher could introduce them to. Sure. Yeah. It, and getting back to that teacherly authority piece of, and I mentioned this in in one of my more recent podcasts talking about this is with my own daughters, there are things that I ask them to do that I'm just going to ask them to do and I want them to learn about I want them to think about I want them to experience that they may or may not think that they want to do part of that though I think and I would I would push back I think that project-based learning is a great way to build some of that basic content knowledge it it can be a difficult piece to to facilitate for it does take skill for sure but from from my perspective, I've seen examples where students come into a project without a whole lot of background knowledge, and I suppose what what I maybe maybe it's it's splitting hairs here. So 
I would say that one of the things that we want to do to get them into a project is to use and expose them to some of that basic context and background knowledge in a way that helps generate interest and hooks them and gets them to start asking questions from which there we can generate and go. And again, the architecture of the project needs to be designed in a way that leads them to, to the learning that we're after, in addition to some other things that perhaps they may find or we hadn't expected. But we know in a, in a good project-based learning experience, that these you know, five, seven, whatever content pieces, however many content pieces we have, those are things that we're intentionally designing for learning and, and understanding of. And so providing them what we would call an entry, entry hook or entry event, something that, that does provide some of that context because it, they may not have any real understanding of it coming into it, but to help create some of that. And I do think that that's important and I think it's possible. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, again, I, uh, you know, it's hard for to, to speak in abstractions. So I think it would, you know, I'm not ruling out the possibility that there could be a project that would effectively, you know, build some pretty basic knowledge. I, I'd have to see what it looked like. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the, I, I, are you familiar with Dan Willingham and his work? No, um, I'm not. So Dan Willingham is a cognitive psychologist at the University of Virginia who has written a lot about um, the cognitive science behind comprehension and learning generally. And I, one of the things that I, I know he said, I, I can't remember where I read it, but somebody asked him, what did, they, what did he think of a project on the Underground Railroad that had the kids uh, baking biscuits that the, <laughs> the slaves would have taken with them, you know, as food on the Underground Railroad? And he said, well, I think what they were likely to remember more than stuff about the Underground Railroad is how much fun they had baking biscuits. Sure. And, and so that, that I think is one of the dangers of, you know, not when, when project-based learning is not well designed, right. the focus of kids' attention may not be where you would like it to be. Yeah, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I think we, we just actually had a conversation on a podcast with Dean Shiresky talking about it. It's a, you know, does education have a Twitter problem? But we also, I, I, sometimes call it a Pinterest problem. And so sort of the, the, the cuteness factor, which I think is especially prescient in the elementary grades for whatever reason, but the, the, the fun element, and I'm certainly in favor of, of kids having fun in education, I do sometimes bristle at that sort of platitude of, you know, let's make education and learning fun. That's, mm -hmm. that's fantastic, but I don't think it's realistic, and it's also, I think, problematic. I think a, a better ideal to pursue is, you know, let's make let's make learning interesting, engaging, empowering, and if we can get fun in there, that's fantastic, but it's not always fun, and yeah. fun is different than interesting and engaging, and so getting students to really engage in the inquiry process and curiosity and uh, doing that in a, in a way that's empowering, I think is a better way because you do run the risk of baking whatever it was, biscuits or cookies, right? Because yeah. so when we think about project-based and when I think about project-based learning and, and here at Teach.PD, the work that we do, we really try to say, all right, what's your product purpose and audience? What are you creating? Why are you creating it and for whom? And those three things, you know, and we want, we want clarity on those three things. And those three things are a great start in our, in my, in my experience to help them help teachers and students lead that project towards the content that and learning that you're after. So, you know, baking cookies or, or biscuits would not be necessarily a very good product to get them to really think about the dynamics and, and, big pieces of you know slavery and the underground railroad and, and all of those kinds of things so yeah yeah i would i'd certainly agree with you there and i i think you know um i don't know exactly what your definition of project is mm -hmm. but um as i mentioned uh, i co-authored a book about using writing as mm -hmm. a as a, a way of teaching content um and i think that's something that has really been overlooked in in favor of more hands-on things and, um, and, and, you know, the fact is that 
writing, it's the hardest thing we ask kids to do in school. It's harder than reading. And it, people often say, oh, reading is the hardest thing we ask them to do. But writing, because it's expressive rather than receptive, is much harder. And we really don't, if for the most part, we don't actually teach kids how to do it. We kind of expect them to pick it up from reading. And they most of them actually don't. But when you explicitly teach writing through, a, you know, through certain strategies, and that that instruction is grounded in the content of what you're trying to teach, it, I am a firm believer that it is the most powerful tool for getting kids to engage with content, to analyze content. And by the way, they're, they're actually learning how to write at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would agree with you that writing I was having a conversation with my 11 year old the other day she was talking about doing just sort of some free writing and it was it was sort of unscripted and they didn't do much work on clarifying their positions but what was it oh it was I think the prompt was something about giving everybody a free education or something of course she she then went to you know well if we do that we'll be in debt and you know some fairly simple surface level sort of objections she was i think she was against the idea of providing free uh, i guess college education for for every person in america or something uh, point being though that she really did think about some things and as she shared it with me i was able to push back with some questions and <laughs> at which point she said well you know dad i didn't have a time i didn't have time to really think about it very well and yeah um, so that that assignment is sort of typical of you know schools are now trying to teach argumentative writing um because the common core has mm -hmm. you know rightly said kids need to learn how to to do that and so they have these sort of separate writing curricula or writing assignments mm -hmm. on topics that kids are just supposed to you know not, nothing to do with the content of the curriculum mm -hmm. Just things like, is it a good idea or a bad idea to have chocolate milk in the cafeteria? Right. Um, and that's a tremendous wasted opportunity to get kids to, to, to spend the time. I mean, if, if you have been learning about, you know, whatever, the Civil War or right. some, you know, mitosis in science, to then write about it, it you, you are drawing on all that you've learned about it and you're deepening that knowledge and you are retaining that knowledge and you're developing analytical and critical thinking skills in the only way they really can be developed which is embedded in a topic that you are actually actually have some knowledge about um, so that's one problem with the way we approach writing and the other problem is just giving kids that kind of a prompt and saying okay go off and write you know a three five paragraph essay or even one paragraph when we haven't actually taught them how to construct good sentences and that a sentence this and and many kids i'm not i don't know about your kids they there's some kids who just like my son just sort of seemed to emerge from the womb knowing how to write complex sentences but most kids don't and um it's something that we have not taught and even a sentence can be an incredibly rigorous uh analytical exercise it all depends on the content that the, that it's embedded in right and so for an example, with our project-based learning, we have an exemplar project. It's called Straw Project. So the, the, the issue is around the legislation banning plastic straws in places like Seattle and things like that. So using a question like, how might we help our state representative and community make better decisions about plastic straw bans? And we think about products. So they've been asked to and it's a it's a because this is is a sort of a generic project it's not for a particular class or anything there's there's lots of sort of generic uh, language we don't have the representative we don't know exactly what city it would need to be tailored but the the uh, they've been asked in in essentially a, a letter a memo from a representative the state representative to create a podcast and position paper uh, position papers so lots of writing there and certainly would would want to have some writing in the podcast as well uh, the purpose of course is to inform the representative and the community about the impact of the of any plastic straw bans and of course the audience there is community and local legislators so really getting into to the weeds and thinking about how do we first of all how do we create a position paper i don't know what a position paper is what is that? Oh, now I know what a position paper is. What, what's, example, what's an example of a good position paper? How do I know to, 
how to do that well, what do I need to know in order to create this position paper and or podcast? And that leads to, uh, we used the, uh, the C3 uh, framework for social studies because, again, we don't know what state necessarily this might be used in. It would be specific, content would be specific for any particular state or location. But, I mean, just tons of social studies content there. You could certainly modify and pull in lots of science could pull in other content areas but yeah i would agree you've got that writing piece is an essential way to process and connect and learn the content and and gain that knowledge and understanding much more deeply yeah so the one of the things that you have have written or certainly are writing about uh, i don't know if you finished writing your book the the knowledge gap and and i'm curious about this as well I wonder about how you define knowledge and that sort of saying of knowledge is power strikes me, has always struck struck me as, as a little bit hollow in a way. I, and I put a tweet about this just recently, I, I think knowledge is certainly really important, but I feel like understanding is a much more powerful ideal to be in pursuit of and of course you need knowledge for the understanding and my my example was you know lots of people know what obamacare is or know what illegal immigration is but very few really understand it so what i i think about is how do we really get a deep understanding not just knowledge so i'm wondering how you define knowledge especially in relation to understanding well, I, I mean, I'd say there are levels of knowledge. I mean, you could know you can know that something exists without understanding what it really is all about. I think that's what you're saying. Um, and you know, I think you you it's it's a cumulative process. Um, you know, you you and and I think it needs to start as I said in elementary school. Um, so maybe in elementary school you learn about you know the Civil War, but you're not learning it with at the same depth and with the same nuance that you would be learning about it in middle school, high school, college, and beyond. But if you don't have an initial familiarity with it, then it's going to be much harder for you to acquire the depth of knowledge that you'll need to acquire later on to really understand it. So Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's, you know, think of the curriculum as a spiral where you circle back to certain concepts that were introduced before. And when you circle back each time you go deeper and ultimately you do have the kind of understanding you're talking about. Yeah. So then circling back, talking about circling back to those students of poverty and inequality, how do you think about equity? And, you know, we're we're really trying to dive into that in lots of different ways. And I feel like it's an important topic and concept but it's one that's sort of riddled with stigma and and some controversy so uh, you you talk about or in your Forbes article you say in the face of poverty and inequality which is different than equity so I'm I'm wondering how you think about those things well um I think you know the we we need to combat poverty and inequality but I think that a A way, what I was arguing is that a hugely important way to do that is through education and what, um, how, you know, it's not that that education is going to make everybody equal. That's, you know, obviously not possible. Mm -hmm. But what education can do is to compensate for um, the, the, the advantages that kids from well, well-educated families who tend to be wealthier, they are essentially born with certain advantages and they, from birth, are hearing more sophisticated vocabulary at home. They're having richer experiences. They may be going to museums. They may be going on trips to Europe, a whole host of things mm-hmm. that many other children through no fault of their own and through no fault of their parents don't have access to. And so what schools can do and and have not been doing well enough is to give those kids who aren't born with those advantages some access to the type of knowledge, the type of vocabulary that other kids are absorbing at home. And that that will not 
you know, completely even the playing field. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I don't think that's possible, but I think it will go a long way towards leveling it out more than it is now. Yeah, that was that was one of the points that Catherine Burblesing made in our podcast that, you know, it is those disadvantaged kids who aren't sitting at the dinner table having those rich conversations and, and those experiences. So they are really missing out on a piece or lots of pieces. I asked her a question towards the end of that podcast, and I, and I think you said you listened to it. I don't know if you listened to all of it, but the, the, the question, and I posed it to her. I wish I'd posed it to her earlier because it, it, it seemed to have struck her in a way that she hadn't thought a lot about. But she certainly, and I think what you're, what you're, th- you're thinking is, is saying is that those, the, the, I guess the pushback to constructivist education is a bit more teacher directed and maybe structured, and, and certainly her approach is, is a, a, best I can tell that way. But when I asked her, would you teach differently to more affluent students who supposedly would have mm-hmm. more of those rich experiences, and she she sort of was struck by that and said, I'm not sure I would really have to think about and assess what they know. So mm-hmm. is there is there a different teaching style and method and, and approach that we would want to take with those different kinds of kids? Well, yeah, I did hear that part of the interview, and I think it's a, it's, it is a, it's a good question. And um, so I my book, I've really focused on el- elementary schools, and I've been to quite a few of them that are uh, using different approaches. And um, among, uh, there, there aren't very many of these, but I have been to some that served a diverse student body. So there were some kids from well-educated families and some kids whose families did not speak English at home and did not have much education. And the interesting thing was that teachers told me, and I, I could see this for myself, that when you teach about something like Greek mythology, for example, that, you know, all kids really can get interested in if it's presented in an engaging way, that the, the kids who have got them are bringing more knowledge to the conversation, they are not only engaged, but they are moving ahead really quickly. And so are the kids. I mean, they're not having exactly the same experience, but also the kids who are coming from the less advantaged background are also engaged in that material and they are also making enormous progress in terms of acquiring knowledge and vocabulary. So I think a knowledge rich curriculum actually can serve all children, engage all children and boost the achievement of all children in a much more effectively than the skills focused kind of education that we are offering now, which really ends up uh, penalizing those kids who are coming in with less knowledge and vocabulary because for one thing, they are relegated to the lower reading groups and they are unlikely to ever move up. And they are is having a very different experience of education. Even if they're in the same classroom with more advantaged students, they're reading different books. They're, you know, if they're acquiring any information or knowledge, it's it's at a different level. So, so then getting at that balance of content and skills, and I'm assuming you wouldn't forego skills completely, but a heavier emphasis on knowledge and or content. I don't know if you use those synonymously or how how closely related those are for you but the when you use content to build knowledge I mean, you know but but when I, when I say skills I want to be clear that um, and so I'm, I'm just talking about you know the sort of the ELA side of the curriculum okay. in elementary school and there are two components of that that are quite different one is the foundational skills uh, foundational reading skills like phonics and and fluency those do need to be taught as skills they're not particularly they, they're not connected really with particular content it's this these other comprehension skills that i feel are um they're they they are being put in the foreground as though they could be taught directly as though you could teach kids directly how to acquire the skill of you know finding the main idea or the skill of making inferences i'm not saying those skills are unimportant what i'm saying is they can only develop in tandem with the development of knowledge. You can only make inferences about something that you understand, that you have the background knowledge to understand. 
So where does the role of inquiry come into there? Because as you talk about that in that way, I think about that being a really rich opportunity to generate and pursue questions because as, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so as I'm reading something, and I, I honestly, I have such a hard time anymore reading books, uh, you know, long-form books, as, as it were, if, as, those are, as though they were short-form books, but, you know, thinking about books as opposed to internet articles and things like that, because, and, and even internet articles, because as I'm going through, I was reading Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now book, I'm, I'm working through that, and, and it's quite lengthy, and of course, I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Pinker, but you yeah. can imagine his, his vocabulary is, is pretty rich, and you know, he says a word, and, and I thought, I've never heard of that word, I have to look that up, what is that, how, do I, how does that word work in this sentence, and so it really starts to generate questions. And so yeah. as I think about constructivist education and the the perhaps false dichotomy between a more traditional and, and teacher-directed uh, education is that that inquiry piece, I want, I think it's a really important skill and, and maybe this is a, a semantic piece that, that we need to flesh out because you're talking more about ELA skills, but the, the ability for people to, uh, from K-12 on up through adults, to be able to ask the right questions and beautiful questions because uh, the example that I've used recently is thinking about the, the 2008 housing crisis and how many people bought houses and, and, and signed up for mortgages for which they had no way that they could possibly pay for and the banks were all too, all too willing to facilitate that and what we should be able to do and need to be able to do is to ask the questions, all right, I want to buy a house what are the things that I need to really know and learn and figure out here? What's a mortgage? What's a what's a mortgage rate? What happens when I can't pay my mortgage? What you know? How long does this last? How much interest? Blah blah blah. So, it seems like if we, uh, I I think including content and knowledge in that inquiry process to me is is a real key here. Absolutely. I mean, you you know the. the it's not just a question of um, pouring information into passive receptacles. Right. Teachers, I mean, it's good teaching to ask questions about the material that I think first of the, the, the first thing you have to do is ensure that, that the students have understood the material, but then you build from there to getting them to think analytically about it. And you can do that through meaning through class discussion and you can do that through writing assignments and you can also encourage students to ask their own questions one of the strategy most powerful strategies um, in the writing revolution approach is to have students write questions about what they're learning about mm -hmm. so absolutely that needs to be integrated that but i would say that that i would not call that you know developing or, or teaching analytical skills or teaching critical thinking i would call that good teaching you know it, it, it good teaching includes getting kids to think about what they're learning and to learn how to ask questions about it right and and that's to me a skill that is just absolutely essential and a way to build that background knowledge and context in in a really meaningful and, and deep learning way and so what I'm hearing you saying is that the idea that students and learners of any age, the idea that they can make meaning of something in in a process and on their own in large part is not necessarily a bad thing, but there's a there's a, a balance there. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think especially with novice learners who who could be you know high school age but if it is a topic that uh, or a subject that they are not familiar with that they don't have much background knowledge about then the teacher the guidance of the teacher is really crucial but the teacher is guiding them to do the thinking the teacher's not doing the thinking for them mm -hmm. absolutely and I, i've seen this in action i so i one of the things i did for the book that's coming out in august is i followed a couple of different early elementary classrooms and one of them was using this prevailing skills focused approach uh, comprehension skills i mean you know in addition to 
other kinds of skills. Um, the other was using a very uh, content rich knowledge building curriculum. And so for the, this was a the, this second class that had been uh, that was using the knowledge building curriculum, they had been exposed to this curriculum since kindergarten. And so they already had by second grade a fair amount of knowledge to, to draw on. And by the way, both of these classrooms were low income kids, um, either African American from native born parents or mostly immigrant kids. Um, and so, for example, one day they this classroom, the second grade classroom, they were learning about ancient Greece and the teacher asked the question, so what was unique about ancient Greece as compared to other ancient civilizations? And a boy raised his hand and said, well, one thing that was unique about them was that they were um, not in, located along a river in fertile land. They were, you know, on islands surrounded by the sea, by the Mediterranean Sea. Now, that is developing analytical abilities right there. That child is thinking about what is the difference between ancient Greece and all the other ancient civilizations we have learned about beginning in kindergarten. They had learned about, you know, Mesopotamia. They had learned about ancient India. They had learned about ancient China. But that child would not have been able to make that analytical judgment if he hadn't built up a pool of knowledge to draw on. And, the, and he also might not have made that analytical judgment if the teacher hadn't asked that very good question. So it's, it's that kind of process. Could that student have made that analysis inside of a project? And, and I'm asking this as a rhetorical question because I think the answer is yes. If, if the teacher had asked students to create, um, there's lots of things they could create, could be a community, a map, or, or I'm, I'm not sure what it might be. Well, actually, yes. I mean, I can tell you, I also um, observed to a limited extent, this, this same group of kids in the previous year when they were in first grade and um, had another wonderful teacher. And at the end of their unit on Mesopotamia and learning about, you know, Babylon, they created their own ancient city out of blocks. And they gave their teachers a tour of the city and explained why, you know, why certain things were where they were. So, yes, that that kind of, but they were doing that because they had already taken in that information largely through read alouds, listening to the teacher read aloud from texts that they couldn't access themselves and discussion. So um, yeah, so there's definitely a place for more hands-on activities. Yeah, uh, well, I'm even thinking in, in past the you know, hands-on activities, but asking students to create something and in that process, they're identifying some things and the teacher is intention has intentionally structured some times where they would really need to know why this was different and how this was going to be successful. I mean, it, it is it's obvious, obviously the the proximity to uh, resources like water and, and those place those kinds of re natural resources are why we have cities and have been successful in those places. So as you try to design something or create something or develop something recognizing that this place is not successful that place is successful but also getting them involved in reading and of course writing and so that they're they're coming to that knowledge and so to me one of the big differences in in the way that i think about constructivist education is shifting from a push model to a pull model so teacher pushing that information out that content that knowledge out and then asking students to re say it back or you know tests or whatever as whatever assessment or evaluation process to a pull model where the the teacher is is posing questions and challenges from which the the thinking is pulled from and to me that's a more durable construction of knowledge and again it is it's difficult it's certainly not an easy process and can easily as we we've, we've talked about and recognized can do it teachers can do it in a way that isn't meaningful and isn't useful so would you say that the teacher's question what was unique about ancient greek civilization as compared to other ancient civilizations would you call that pushing or pulling um i it it would depend upon which context 
why would they the question to me is why would they need to know that why 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 is knowing that information important and if it's important because we need to know that in order to you know fulfill this challenge or meet this challenge or the answer this driving question essentially which is project based learning then that would be pull if it's I'm asking you this question because I asked you to read this and I'm checking to see if you got it and I you got it or you don't got it and now I'm going to record that as a score because it, the the question to me is are am I learning this because it's important to the teacher to because I'm going to get a grade for it it's going to be on a test or what sometimes teachers say is you're going to need this in the future which doesn't resonate with certainly elementary kids and even high school kids well i'll tell you at the elementary level kids are just interested in learning stuff i mean they're very excited about you know maybe not every single thing but you know i saw them learning about mummies in first grade they were a greek mythology you know i think um it gets to be more of a problem maybe at the high school level when kids are saying, well, what does this have to do with my life? But the, I think the other explanation for why it's important to learn a lot of things is that it equips you to learn more things in the future. If you know something about, if you know what the meaning, the meaning of the word fertile, for example, if you know something about ancient civilizations, it's very hard to say, well, that's going to serve you for this particular thing, you know, 10 years from now. But that knowledge is going is contributing to a store of knowledge that will enable you to acquire more knowledge that will be important to you in the future. If you don't have it, you're going to be tremendously handicapped in acquiring a lot of knowledge. Oh, absolutely. But what I that I I find that that is that's a hard sell with kids because they it that doesn't resonate with them. That's that's a hard thing to conceptually. It's, a, it's sort of an abstract thing, especially for elementary kids. And so as adults, we recognize that, but do the students recognize it? So that pull model for me gets them to engage in in creating something that they find interesting and engaging. And, and I would agree with you that elementary students, for the most part, are certainly much more compliant. They Their curiosity hasn't, uh, hasn't seemed to sort of dim, but it also... A, as we think about going from elementary to middle to high, the student level of engagement drops. And and it's certainly not only because of the style of teaching and the way that schools are are structured, but I think that's a large part. So I find with my fourth and sixth graders that my fourth grader is not really complaining much, my sixth grader, and and she goes to a school that is not focused on test scores, both of them do, uh, and they don't do lots of test prep, and, and it's not a lot of that that uh, philosophy, but my sixth grader. Now, part of this is, is absolutely natural and, and certainly an anecdotal, but, you know, I don't want to go to school. Oh, you know, that kind of drudgery, right. which certainly is a, you get into middle school, there's lots of reasons for that. But, and, and even in the best, I mean, I love the work that I do, but there's sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to do this work, right? You know, that that's certainly right. normal. But if we can shift to, I think, to more of that pull teaching and, and that model, which, is constructivist in nature, but it needs to be done well for sure. And I acknowledge the challenges, and and that's that's a that's certainly another issue. To me, that w- would help, and and I've seen evidence of it helping keep that sort of engagement level up pretty high. Because the number of student, the number of questions that that kids ask just absolutely drops and plummets from like age, you know, what f- four or five on down up to high school. And I think that one of the things that would be helpful is to to embed inquiry in our teaching and learning in a much more powerful way throughout K-12 because it certainly, it goes away in lots of, of classrooms. Right, when I think there, there are two different things that I'm hearing and one is um, we need to foster inquiry and intellectual engagement, but the other thing is we need to um, teach kids things that they themselves uh, feel feel relate to their lives or to what they need. And I think the second one is really more problematic because I'm I'm all for engaging kids in their learning, but, you know, there are a lot of things that kids really need to learn that they may not see as 
particularly relevant to their own lives. Sure. Um, but you you know, a good teacher can get them interested in those things anyway. And one, I would, uh, again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but one way to do that at the high school level in, in particular is through writing. Um, I think that, you know, I've seen this, that kids who are not, you know, experienced writers and who have not been taught how to put sentences together and paragraphs together, it's tremendously empowering for them to learn how to do this and to use connecting words like moreover. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it really um, forces them to grapple with whatever the content is that they're being taught. And I think it's not always easy, but I think it can be quite satisfying for them. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I guess it, it, maybe this is, is helpful in in the characterization. So the the questions, the, those content pieces that as adults we we know are really important, and you know, acknowledging that sometimes students may or may not find them interesting and engaging, and want to to get into them just on the surface level. So I see project based learning as a way to sort of do this dynamic of or answer this question of of how do we get how can we use questions that are important to them to also get them to answer and think about and learn about questions that are important to us as adults because those things are important even though they may not want to get into them so can we use a question and a project and have it well designed so that they they do think about and need to think about those things that are important to us as adults and we know that will help them build their knowledge in the future and to be successful and you know some of those are writing some of those are knowledge pieces so to me it's a really it's it's, a, it's such a powerful model to get them to those pieces in in a way that's more contextualized and in, in something that they're interested in mm-hmm well, it certainly can be. I mean, you know, I, again, I think another uh, another big question is, you know, how do you, given that it's hard to do that, it's hard for teachers to pull this off, you know, how do we get a lot of teachers to mm-hmm. use project-based learning in a way that is really, that, that accomplishes what we want to accomplish? Yeah, and it is a real struggle. I mean, we do our professional development workshops and try to get student or schools to acknowledge or, or I think they, they acknowledge and recognize it's just a, a different way that we think about professional development in our schools that I, we do a workshop, it's two or three days, and it should be a process because it is a pretty big shift and it's a pretty difficult piece. Um, you mentioned the constructivist pieces of teacher preparation, which uh, at, when you said that at the beginning of our conversation, I almost chuckled because I, I thought about I mean, my my understanding of teacher preparation and mine was certainly many years ago. But constructivism, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times we work with brand new teachers and they say, I've never heard of project based learning. So mm-hmm. I'm not seeing evidence of lots of constructivism in our teacher preparation programs. Well, I mean, there are aspects of constructivism that, you know, there are two different things to some extent. Project-based learning may grow out of constructivism and may have, you know, developed on those principles. But they're learning about, you know, Piaget and they're learning about, right. you know, I, I mean, I have not been to, to a teacher training program myself. So I just know what I've read and what teachers have told me. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're there's a lot of stuff that teachers are not learning that could actually be incredibly helpful to them in the classroom. Absolutely. Well, one last thing before I let you go, and I, I, I found it kind of, again, worth a chuckle, is that when you talked about extreme form of, of constructivist education and mentioned Alfie Cohn, and then your more recent article, which is about homework, which Alfie Cohn, I'm guessing you're familiar mm-hmm. with, is is really... Uh, uh, critical of so what tell us more a little bit more about your your thinking uh i will certainly link to the forbes articles that we've mentioned but as you think about homework what's what's homework what should homework look like well i you know i think home so there are people who are just sort of against homework in general and i think there's certainly possible for for homework to be busy work and and i mean i have kids and i've saw that just sometimes but what um, 
puzzled me was that there was this research out there saying that homework didn't really boost academic achievement, especially at the elementary level. And there's a modest effect at the middle and high school levels. I also am aware of a bunch of, you know, evidence from cognitive psychology on learning strategies that would seem to lend themselves very well to homework, like asking yourself questions or answering questions about what you've learned, you know, not in the distant past, but long enough ago that you've forgotten it a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So like, you know, maybe earlier that day. And I realized that, you know, among the other things that teachers often don't learn in their training is how, how and why to assign homework. And they don't learn these principles of cognitive science, like this thing I just described, which is often called the retrieval practice, Um, retrieving information from your long-term memory, which strengthens it and, and, you know, really embeds it there. And so, uh, yes, homework can be, you know, a waste of time. And I think it often is these days, especially at elementary school, where there really isn't enough content being taught to make you know, you're not going to get a boost from retrieval practice if you're not, you don't have anything to retrieve. (laughs) Um, But I think if teachers got more help in designing homework assignments, so even a brief one, even 10 minutes at, at the first grade level of thinking about what you learned earlier that day in a way that really cements it in your long term memory, it could have quite a boost on academic achievement. Yeah, I think uh, and I've written a, a blog piece, I think it's entitled The Problem with Homework, and, and I think about homework as the the father of two daughters who, like I said, are fourth and sixth grade now, and our schools have, have varied their approaches to homework. I certainly don't think it necessarily is bad, but it is often bad in the way that it's administered and, and what it's done and what, or what it's trying to do. And, and I think that's it, you know, you kind of alluded to it is what's, what's the purpose here? What are we trying to, to, to achieve? And we certainly don't want it to be for points that you can put in a grade book. If that's the only reason you're assigning homework and that's maybe one of the worst case scenarios, but thinking about how can I get students to think and extend and also, do some formative assessment from what they're thinking about. And I'm also a fan of not necessarily putting grades on those, at least not on most of them. And I I stopped putting grades on my homework, which was a very short set of of hopefully deep questions that really made them think and was illuminating into whether I thought they got it or didn't get it kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I, I, I think that homework, as you say, sort of needs to be rethought. And instead of the, the binary choice of homework or not homework, there's certainly room for nuance and complexity there. And I would add that, and I didn't really write about this as much in the blog post, but at the high school level, certainly, when you're asking kids to read novels or you're asking them to read about you know history or you're asking them to write an essay, if they're not doing homework, which is the case in a lot of low achieving schools that serve high poverty populations, that those kids are really, they're not in the habit of doing homework and there are really no consequences if they don't do homework. And so teachers cannot assume that everybody in the class has read anything in particular. They, they end up spending a lot of class time reading, having kids read in class or reading aloud to them or having kids write in class. And that takes up enormous amounts of time that could be better spent on, you know, analytical class discussion or, you know, something that that is not just a bunch of kids sitting there each individually, you know, taking in information. Right, right. No, I would agree with that. Well, her name is Natalie Wexler. You have an upcoming book called The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. It's due out, looks like, in August. So give our listeners uh, where they can find you and the appropriate links. I know you're on Forbes and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, and I have a website, NatalieWexler.com, that, you know, has a lot of information about both books and uh, links to the Forbes columns. Okay, and social media, I know you're on social media, right? Yeah, um, on Twitter, um, the handle is at Nat Wexler, um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, I think. Okay. 
Well, I appreciate the conversation, and I'm always interested in talking with folks who are, are thoughtful. And like we said before we went live, I think we have some some overlaps and maybe some differences. I, I, I think it's interesting how you define constructivism, but I think it's a lot of it is more in the, the sense of uh, literacy skills as opposed to the way that some other folks think about constructivism. But um, yeah, again, I really appreciate it. Yeah, same here. It was really a pleasure talking with you. That'll do it for today's podcast episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget to review us and share us on your network so we can grow our audience to better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to find us on our websites, teachthought.com and wegrowteachers.com, as well as our various social media outlets.